Live from our hurricane headquarters with real-time analysis from some of the nation's top meteorologists, this is Tracking the Tropics. Inside Hurricane Ian with the Hurricane Hunters, the team that flew into the most devastating storm in Southwest Florida history. They're here with us in the Stream Center to answer your questions as we break down the very latest about Hurricane Ian and what else is out there in the tropics. Hey there, folks. JB here with you live in the WFL Now Stream Center. Great to have, of course, Chief Meteorologist Jeff Beardelli. And joining us, yes, from the NOAA Hurricane Hunters, it is Nick Underwood, Nikki Hathaway on standby to answer your questions live. Really looking forward to hearing from them in regards to Hurricane Ian. Before we do so, of course, we're going to let you know that we're going to be monitoring your Facebook Live and YouTube Live comments. See the hashtags all around your screen. We're really looking for, of course, Hashtag Hey Nick and Hashtag Hey Nikki for, of course, our special guests in the Stream Center. But before we actually get to the conversation about Hurricane Ian and the Hurricane Hunters, we're going to send things over to meteorologist Rebecca Barry with the very latest on what's currently going on in the tropics and whether or not Julia is anywhere close to being out there as far as the Atlantic. Rebecca. We did think that we were going to be looking at potentially tropical storm Julia today, but now that's not as clear. We're watching two areas. This is Invest 90L right, 91L right here, and we're just starting to track that. It's looking a little bit more organized than it did yesterday. This is Tropical Depression 12, and originally we did think Tropical Depression 12 was going to become Julia, and now it's not looking as organized, not looking as good. When you take a look at it on satellite, there's no real center of rotation. It's just really disorganized, really lopsided thunderstorms at this point. And so further development is now not expected with Tropical Depression 12. It's a fish storm. It's going to remain out over the open Atlantic, and then it ceases to exist after tomorrow. At that point, it's not even a low pressure system. So it's really going to fall apart over the next couple of days and so that is most likely not going to become tropical depression julia it's moving to the west northwest at nine miles per hour and those maximum winds they're only around 35 miles per hour the forecast models all keep it out over the open atlantic never really making landfall anywhere before it starts to fall apart so we don't really have to worry about tropical depression 12. we are watching tropical wave it's an invest 91 l at this point and it does look a little bit better than it did yesterday on the satellite now we don't have a track for this one yet because it doesn't have a name or a number but when you take a look at the spaghetti forecast models, there's a pretty good agreement that it will continue to track to the west. Some of the intensity forecasts do expect it to develop into what could be named, take the next name, which is Julia, but that's not evident. There's no timeline on that right now. We'll get into more favorable environments once it does get into the open Caribbean here. Now, all of the forecast models do bring it towards the Nicaragua, Venezuela landfall there, and then across the peninsula. Some of them yesterday were curving them out into the western Gulf, and so that's still a slight possibility, but it would be so land sheared at that point. It would really not be a concern. It would be a rainmaker for Texas and possibly Mex Mexico and possibly Texas, but we don't see any scenario that would bring it back towards the Tampa area. And so this is really a forecast that is not what Ian was, and it's in a similar area, but it's a whole different week, and we have high pressure to thank for that. We are looking at high pressure. Of course, air goes clockwise around a high pressure. This is Invest 91L. Air goes counterclockwise around a low pressure. And so the high pressure is going to block 91L from turning to the north. It's going to stay there. That that counter clock, that clockwise air airflow will keep it moving westward across the Gulf towards Nicaragua and not allow it to make that more northerly turn until it's past the Gulf. It could make the turn once it gets past the Gulf if it survives that long, but that is really, really unlikely. And of course, the popular topic of the day is Hurricane Hunters. We've got them in studio with us to answer your questions as soon as you fire up those hashtags. Hey, Nick. Hey, Nikki. Hey, Jeff. Or hey, JB. And this is the current Hurricane Hunter aircraft that's flying through the storm, that Invest 91L, finding 44 mile per hour winds and a surface pressure of 1,000 millibars. So I know we want to get to the main event and answer all your questions about that exciting flight. I'm going to send it back over to you guys. Thank you, Rebecca. Again, with the very latest on TD-12 and 91L, we're going to send things right over to Max Fender 8 Chief Meteorologist Jeff Beardelli with our two special guests in the Stream Center. Jeff? Yeah, I'm excited to have both of you here, so, so thank you for joining us. Um, wow. I mean, Ian was turned out to be quite the storm. It's been devastating for the people of Southwest Florida. Um, you knew that going in um, because you were flying through the storm. Now, Nikki, were you in the storm as well that day? So I was actually supporting from the ground that day. We have 11 different aircraft in our actual hangars. We're making sure we're getting those to save spots if they weren't flying to the storm itself. 
but you were actually in the air during the storm, and I saw the lightning within the system. And by the way, JB, so you know, we have a uh, graphic that's going to show um, the progression of the storm as it made landfall and just kind of loops over and over again, so we're going to be able to see that lightning. But when I saw that lightning, I thought, oh boy, this is, this is, this is a rapidly intensifying storm. What did you find in the storm? Uh, so we took off from Ellington Field, uh, right near Houston, Texas, at around uh, 3 a.m. local time. Uh, that was central time, so 4 a.m. Uh, Eastern. We got to the storm at around 6 a.m. Eastern, and we had got a call from our friends at the 53rd Weather Reconnaissance Squadron up in Biloxi, Mississippi. They were flying the storm as well, and they informed us that they had just done their first pass through the northwest part of the eye wall, and they had had a rough time. Mm -hmm. And so we knew going in that we were going to be having a rough flight that day. Uh, we descended down to 8,000 feet, which is our operational altitude. Uh, the, our flight director on board set us on a track through the storm, uh, targeting the eye, and we started going. And immediately, we encountered some pretty, uh, pretty heavy turbulence. There was a ton of lightning, uh, more than I had ever seen in a storm before. And I had shared some pictures uh, of the eye once we actually got in there, and it looks like it's daytime, but in fact, it was still 6 a.m. before I the sun that. had come up. Yeah. yeah. And so that was because of lightning. There was so much lightning that you could just see in the eye like it was 11 o'clock in the morning. I know that something like a thousand lightning strikes were measured in one hour uh, around the eye of that storm. Um, so, as a meteorologist, um, what was going through your mind that morning while you were watching kind of the night before we had an eye wall replacement cycle? Mm -hmm. And then, you know, essentially the table was set with water temperatures, you know, 88 to 90 degrees down there in the Florida Bay for it to rapidly intensify. So what was going through your mind as you were watching this unfold? Sure. And I mean, even being on the ground as a, a meteorologist, your interest is peaked with a storm making landfall of this kind anywhere, you know, in the U.S. or its territory. So you're watching all the things that you'd want to look out for. Like you said, the um, temperatures of the water, the lightning going off in the eye wall where it's usually mostly concentrated, things like that. Um, so our partners, our National Hurricane Center, uh, you know, colleagues are over there building the forecast, making sure that all the data that they're getting from our aircraft is really helping to go into those uh, changes to the track if they need to make them, um, especially closer to landfall like that. So really, it's just one of those events where you're paying close, close attention to all the latest data as it's coming in, whether that be from our aircraft or the 53rd. You know, I think people would be surprised to know that there aren't there isn't usually that much lightning inside of very organized tropical systems, especially near the core. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So I think th the same question to you, what is it about tropical systems, why they lack lightning, and why when we see a lot of lightning, we know that something nefarious is going on at that moment? Mm -hmm. Well, when you think about a, trop a tropical cyclone, you're really thinking about that lateral movement that's going on, um, that horizontal wind component, right? And that shear that um, you hear a lot of folks talk about, especially in the meteorology community. So when you get enough of that updraft to really cause it to really just go vertical with it, especially in the eye wall, uh, a lot of the times you're going to see some increase in lightning. And that's going to be concentrated to those eye wall replacement cycles, those inner eye wall rings, um, such as the one that Nick was describing, when you really see a lot of flashes. Otherwise, in the outskirts of the storm, where things are a little bit more stratiform, more stable rain um, bands, not so convective in nature, you don't really see as much of that lightning. So that's really where we're looking for it. So the idea is, is all this lightning, you must have a lot of upward movement, a lot of vertical motion, which you wouldn't typically see as much in hurricanes, which have a lot of what you said, lateral mm -hmm. motion or you know, horizontal motion around the eye. And so essentially, does that mean you have these overshooting tops? You have so much vertical motion that you end up with turbulence and you end up in a situation like, like you ended up in. J JB, do we want to play the clip of him? Uh, do you have one of him almost cursing, I think? I think is I it, do. Okay, well, yeah. Can you unbeep it or is that not possible? I know. I think it's already bleeped I, I out. Know, <laughs> so we'll, so I'll, I'll cue that up. I'll cue that I mean, up here in a second. That must have been scary. It was, uh, it was quite the hit we took. And, um, you know, this, this video... I posted a, a two minute and 20 segment on Twitter. That was a small part of a 10 minute video. And so it was 10 minutes of, of getting bounced around like that. Man, I would have jumped out. I mean, I think <laughs> I would have jumped out. Um, uh, let's, uh, let's, let's play yeah, that clip. Let's, we'll yeah. be back here in just a moment.
So, you know, you are a public servant. You're doing this for the public, for the, for the betterment of the country, for the betterment of the people, for the betterment of science. And, you know, it's a, danger, it's a dangerous job. I mean, you can see it. It seems like a dangerous job. There's, uh, there's risk involved, but we do everything we can to do this as safely as possible. All of that starts on the ground. We have an excellent maintenance team. These are aging aircraft, but they're taken care of like they're brand new. We've got the best maintenance folk. We have uh, the best pilots on board, you know, up front, holding on to the controls as we're going through all of this turbulence. There's a flight engineer up front who's working the throttles and the other subsystems on the aircraft. The meteorologist on board, our flight directors, navigators, technicians, engineers, all of these people are on the aircraft doing their job, making sure that we're doing this as safely as possible so that we can come home. Right. Uh, and, and while you're in the storm, you must have realized what this was going to mean to Florida. I'll ask you uh, that. You must have realized, you know, it, this was forecast to get its act together slightly faster in the Caribbean. It took a little extra time. And I know uh, during my 11 o'clock broadcast the night before, when I saw it just finally completed its eyewall replacement cycle, that meant that now we were going to see likely intensification straight up to landfall. You almost wished that the organization had happened earlier so that maybe it went through an eyewall replacement cycle and kind of weakened a little bit as it was making landfall. So you must have realized the, the, um, the significance of this happening at that moment, literally hours before it made landfall in southwest Florida. Absolutely. So anytime you have a system undergoing that eyewall replacement cycle like you're talking about, you know, you hope that happens early enough where it gives you a little bit more of that, that heads up, that lead time to, to really understand that stability of the system now that it has gone through its reorganization process. And when you're having storms move over the Caribbean like this one did, um, you're having those land interactions, which definitely cause some sort of internal, uh, you know, disorganization with the system. And so those eyewall replacement cycles do tend to happen over the water mostly. And that was the case with this one. So we saw it a little bit later than maybe, you know, it would have been nice to have seen. Um, that said, you know, this thing was forecast to become a major hurricane mm -hmm. well ahead of in, in advance. Um, right. National Hurricane Center had that out. And we knew those waters were warm. Shear was low until it moved up into the northern Gulf. So um, it's just one of those things we always have to be prepared for this time of year. So, uh, JB, we have a, a loop of the storm as it made its way on land. It's on our weather computer. I just want to show everybody because you'll be able to see. I added lightning to this. So you can see right there, look at all that lightning right around the center, mm -hmm. the core of the storm. Then, of course, the, the strongest part of the storm, northwestern side, which is odd, but, you know, I guess during fall with a mm -hmm. cold front to the north and outflow and all that stuff, um, this was an interesting storm from a scientific perspective uh, and essentially a worst, you know, base, basically a worst case scenario too. The contour of the coast near Fort Myers Beach here comes to a right angle. So that probably kind of helped to, to funnel the surge in. But, but clearly, as we look at it one more time, look at all that lightning. That's what you were flying through. Mm -hmm. um, and again, that's not something that we see very standardly, just indicating there's going to be lots of turbulence in the storm. Mm -hmm. So, JB, I know the questions are probably going to start oh, yeah. coming in, so bunch, we might as well. Coming in. Right? They don't want to hear me talk. They want to they wanna answer. They want to ask their questions and hear you guys. So, Yeah, we're going to turn things over. And, of course, we're going to continue to take questions from, from Jeff because there's a great conversation to be had here with our audience. So, folks, see the hashtags all around your screen. If you use a hashtag, you can, of course, ask a question to one of our special guests in the Stream Center. Again, Nick Underwood, Nikki Hathaway of the Hurricane Hunters. So the first two that are coming in, this is from Facebook Live. Kristen Johnson from WPRI in Rhode Island wants to know, hashtags for both of our guests, is the plane uh, specially made for you to fly through storms and hurricanes? And then also, too, we've got JM joining us on YouTube Live. Hashtag, hey, Jeff. How does the plane that you guys were in not twist and turn, being in the storm so strong? And then also adding my respect to you and the courageous team to keep us informed. Yeah, so I don't know anything about the plane, so I'm going to defer to, to both of you guys to, to talk uh, about I, I think I can take this one as the, as the engineer in the room. So our aircraft is a WP-3D Orion. And so this is a modified uh, P-3 aircraft, which was originally made for the Navy to hunt submarines. And so the two that we have was made specially for NOAA in the mid-1970s. Other than uh, getting the uh, belly radar onto the bottom of the aircraft, the floor being structurally reinforced because we have some heavy science racks with a lot of equipment in it, and the tail being modified to account for our tail Doppler radar. Those are the only three major modifications to this aircraft. Otherwise, it's just the P3 Charlie platform, uh, the same one that the Navy used. And how does it stay together going through winds like this all the time? Aircraft are pretty bulky creatures. Uh, they're made to last. Uh, and. Um, Aircraft also fly through very high winds all the time. 
um, especially like passenger aircraft. I'm sure you've been on a flight where you've landed an hour early because you've gotten into the Gulf Stream or, uh, or sorry, the jet stream. Um, and that has helped push you along. And so aircraft are always going through winds of that type. And really, it's our pilots on board and it's our flight engineers that are keeping us on speed, keeping us straight and level. Mm -hmm. And it's those things that really keep us from overstressing the aircraft. Um, we did say we did take some pretty hefty hits uh, in Ian. We had a 2.5 G hit uh, on our aircraft. We measured that at a uh, meter in our in our uh, main load center. So what does that mean uh, for so, a guy like me who has? So right know, now we're experiencing one G, okay. right? So 2.5 Gs, you weigh two and a half times more uh, than force, what you actually the force, are. The force, the pressure on and, you. Yes, exactly, pulling you down. So that's just a little taste of what our aircraft experienced going through Ian. Let's get to this Anything one. Anything to add, by the way? Well, maybe, maybe okay. I'd like to hear from oh, Nikki about okay. this because this one is, is, is for both of them. Mm -hmm. Liz M on YouTube Live, hashtag Hey Nick, hashtag Hey Nikki. What do you guys do? How do you prepare before flights? So the, the flight's really sure. It's, it's a couple hours after we actually arrive on station. So once we arrive on station, we're focused on getting all of our expendables, things like our drop signs, our BTs, which uh, measure our water temperature below the aircraft. Um, different expendables on board the plane, making sure it's gassed up, ready to go, and everyone's in the right headspace. But besides just that, we're also preparing briefings. So as the flight director or the flight meteorologist on board the aircraft, what we do is we make sure we're going through, getting the latest data, talking to the folks at the National Hurricane Center, making sure we have the latest to make sure we brief our crews what they need to know and what to anticipate before we head into the storm. And so that preparation can take an hour to two hours ahead of actual takeoff. So we'll have a brief once uh, we're on the aircraft as well, just a quick one, any sort of changes that might have happened to the forecast, maybe what the 53rd, our Air, uh, the Air Force Hurricane Hunters might have found if they were out there flying or our other aircraft, um, Kermit or Piggy, depending on who's out there flying, see what their latest fix might have been inside the storm. So we're always really refreshing ourselves on the data before taking off and going into the storm environment. We also have a lot of questions coming in, you guys, about, I think you just answered it, Nikki, as far as the green creature hanging here in the cockpit. Oh, yeah. So, so explain, because now I think we know that that's a certain Muppet, correct? Yes, yes that is Kermit. Um, our heavy aircraft are named after a few of the Muppets. So two of our P3s are Kermit and Miss Piggy. Miss Piggy is uh, jing jingling around in the other aircraft, the other P3 that you would see, not in this video, but um, this was uh, 42 flying through. And then on our jet, Gonzo is actually what we name our G4 jet after. So Gonzo is on on board the G4 jet as well. I'm smiling here because <laughs> so so the Muppets are the theme. Clearly, Muppets yeah, are the theme. Seriously, uh, Kermit looked a little green though. Is that from the turbulence? And, and being, is that no? Okay. Well, it's not easy being green. Right. It's <laughs> not easy being green. Uh, is it easy riding out a storm? Because Sharon uh, on actually on my Facebook page wants to know hashtag Hey Nick for you mm -hmm. Nick. Uh, how difficult was it uh, riding the storm out? Uh, it was definitely the worst flight that I've been on in the six years doing this. Um, the most turbulence that I've experienced, and there were folks on board who have been doing this a lot longer than I have, and they agreed that this was, if not the top, at least a top three, like, worst flight for them. Not just the amount of turbulence, but, um, or the level of turbulence, but the amount of, like, sustained turbulence that we were flying through. As I mentioned earlier, uh, that clip is from a 10-minute video, so it was 10 minutes of getting bounced around like that. Nikki, anything to, to add uh, about uh, how difficult it was to ride out the storm? No, you know, every storm's so different. And so you always go in anticipating the worst, right? You never want to be kind of complacent before you go and fly into, especially a storm of this nature. So really just making sure you're in the right mindset and getting prepared ahead of time allows us to do our job efficiently. And really, even as you're getting bumped around, we're still throwing out expendables. We're still collecting data, quality controlling the data. So you kind of have to have your mind focused and fixed mm -hmm. while maybe getting a little bumped around. <laughs> yeah, you got to work. You mm -hmm. have to be working. I, I was a commercial fisherman for a time. And yeah, I mean, you know, you get bounced around like crazy. You have to be able to maintain your sanity mm -hmm. and still work. Now, your your job is much more important than, than mine was, uh, but uh, but I don't know how you do it. You'd have to give me sedative, to be honest with you, uh, on the plane. Jeff, you're saying, could you do it? Could you ride? No, uh, no you couldn't do it at all. <laughs> I wouldn't even try, no. I'm keeping both of my, my my feet planted firmly on solid ground. Well, that's good because we, we need you here to to forecast our storms and uh, and keep people safe and aware as to what's going on out there. And that brings us to the wake up call on YouTube Live uh, hashtag Hey Nick. But I'm sure Jeff is going to chime in here. Uh, are there more storms 
uh, coming to Florida. Uh, the wake up call says, I sure hope not. I'm so over this. My children and I have had no power or clean running water mm. for a week now. And really thinking about all those out Horrible. there uh, without power as we bring up some of the video for the first time on this live stream, uh, showing everybody some of the devastation uh, that has occurred. Mm -hmm. uh, this is a uh, an eagle flight, uh, Jeff, as you know, from uh, Fort Myers Beach. You're yeah. also going to see sections of Pine Island, Sanibel Island, some of the areas hardest hit by Hurricane Ian. That was a great question. Uh, I'd say a couple things. First of all, you know, we always talk about surviving the storm. People always think we mean surviving the actual impact mm -hmm. of the storm. But so often, the really taxing part is after the storm, which can go on for days, weeks, and in this case, probably years mm -hmm. of recovery. So we definitely feel for everyone in that area right now, uh, life has been turned upside down. I mean, mm -hmm. that's the bottom line. And, and this is really an inflection point in people's lives. They will talk about their lives from now on as before Ian and after Ian. I know because I worked in Miami for many, many, many years, and people talk about their lives before Andrew and after Andrew. So the other part of that question uh, was, do we expect any more threats to Florida? And at least in my mind, at least through October, there's always the threat that we could still see a, uh, a hurricane. Um, it gets a little less likely in November, but we have quite a ways left in hurricane season, Nikki. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, we absolutely do. We got to remain prepared. Just because you got hit once doesn't mean that it's not possible. Lightning to get doesn't again. strike in the same place twice, but it's not. Un that's not true. It can absolutely, strike in the same yes. Place twice. That's right. So we need to be ready for that. Mm -hmm. How about you? What What are your thoughts, Nick? Uh, can, you I always, can you, since you're an engineer, can you engineer a, a <laughs> storm to kind of like get it, leave us and move in a different direction? You know, it's funny because we did have a question in our comment section about that. Like, can we just, you know, use the science of the hurricane hunters to push storms away? Instead of hunting hurricanes, can we re-navigate them out <laughs> into the Atlantic? Uh, unfortunately, the amount of energy required to do that, it's, it's not going to be possible. That question, every time we do mm -hmm. it... Uh, it it's just omnipresent, that question, can we as humans, you know, manipulate the track of hurricanes? And you're right, it's it's just, the amount of energy it would take is mm -hmm. tremendous. We, people always throw out, why don't we put a nuclear bomb into a, into a hurricane, which probably wouldn't do much of anything. But even if we were able to reroute the hurricane, okay, fine. Now, instead of it going towards Fort Myers, it's headed towards Tampa. Or mm -hmm. instead of it heading towards Tampa, it's headed towards Pensacola. You're always going to reroute it towards somebody else. So mm -hmm. there's no good answer there. Mm -hmm. It's not to say that we could even do that right now. Let's go to this question from Brody, hashtag hey Nick. Uh, and again, all around conversation based on these questions. Can you be a hurricane hunter with a meteorology degree? Uh, how do you become a hurricane hunter with a meteorology degree is what Brody is asking in our comment section a a as well, you guys. Well, so Nikki is a meteorologist. Yes. <laughs> so uh, all of our, our flight directors are flight meteorologists. They have meteorology degrees um, from various universities. So that is a requirement for the meteorology position for the NOAA hurricane hunters. Um, even, you know, across the board in our other occupations, engineers, things like that, uh, there are certain degrees that are required. So there is a, you know, a, a pathway to getting into one of these positions. You know what's interesting is that we have another meteorologist on staff. Opposite of you, Jeff, loves to be up in the that's air, right. and that's Amanda Holly, who uh, wanted to be here today, but she's over at the NASA uh, uh, Kennedy Space Center for the SpaceX launch today. Um, but uh, it, it, it takes a certain type of person a crazy to be able person. to... A crazy a person. A crazy there you person. go. Just be Jeff, honest here, okay? It's, Jeff, it's a crazy there, there you go. It's a crazy person to be able to work at the altitudes Luckily, that you guys Luckily, some people do. are crazy, though, because we need them. <laughs> Nick, how we crazy, crazy, how like crazy is crazy? Uh, I, I wouldn't say it's crazy. I would say it's it's dedicated. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, each of us, uh, whether we're meteorologists, engineers, pilots, mechanics, we signed up to do this job because it matters for folks on the ground. Mm -hmm. The data that we're out there collecting is so important for these forecast models. It's so important to be able to forewarn people mm -hmm. when a storm is headed their way, and and we're proud and happy to do that. Mm -hmm. It was the hurricane hunters. This So this was a 120 mile an hour storm at four o'clock in the morning. It was you guys, it was hurricane hunters, who said, uh-uh, we have new data that says this is a lot stronger, and they upgraded it to 155 miles an hour, almost, almost a Cat 5. So it was it was you, uh, your team, essentially, that rang the alarm and said, no, this is a lot stronger, mm -hmm. right? Yeah, I mean, and it, and it really comes back down to the overall team, right? So we are the data collectors. So we're not spending our time, even as a meteorologist, I'm not spending my time forecasting. I'm making sure the data that we are collecting is quality controlled, best of its ability, before it goes off to the National Hurricane Center, the Environmental Modeling Center, all of our partners that we work so closely with and the forecast team, right? And then even more so, once it hits the National Hurricane Center and they push out whatever warnings that they want to, you know, adjustments to the cone, things like that, it comes back down to that local level. Mm -hmm. And that's when the National Weather Service comes on board and then the media. So right. it's a huge partnership across, across the board um, to really get the message out to the people. Mm -hmm. 
let's go to our, our next question because I think I think that this is one that Nick is going to be able to, to answer for us. Uh, Vins on YouTube Live, hashtag KJB. I found a few of the things that you drop with GPS, kind of like a reverse rocket. Oh, How has, often you, you drop hotel. those things. And look, and Nick has it here with us. So can you explain what those are? And also, too, Vins is saying he said that he found a few of them. So is that something you're going to find on your front lawn or your backyard? Uh, we, I've never heard of us really having someone find these. Uh, we only launch them over water, and they sink to the bottom. And so mm -hmm. if they're washing up, that's, that's news to Maybe us. That's a fish. So. Maybe it's a fish. Is <laughs> yeah. it a fish? But, Who uh, knows? So this is a uh, GPS drop sonde. So think of this like a weather balloon, but in reverse. Mm -hmm. And so we drop these from the bottom of the aircraft. They have a parachute that comes out that slows them down and keeps them stable. And as they're falling through the atmosphere, they're collecting temperature, pressure, humidity, wind speed, and wind direction. There's a radio transmitter inside. And so all of that data is getting sent back to our aircraft in real time, where the operator is quality controlling the data, making sure that it looks good. Uh, once this splashes in the ocean, that's when we will send this data off to our friends at the Environmental Modeling Center, the National Hurricane Center, the Hurricane Research Division, whoever wants or needs to look at it. Mm -hmm. And typically we'll launch between 20 to 30 of these uh, over the course of a single flight all throughout the storm. Uh, the most important one is one that we drop at the very center of the storm. And that's where we really do the hunting part of this job. So the flight director will be looking at the winds and once we are in the eye, they'll be looking to when those winds get right down to zero, because that is where the center of the storm is. That's where all of that energy is really trying to flow to. We'll drop us on there, we'll mark that point, and then we'll make our way back out of the storm. So I'm curious, how does it measure wind? I, I you know, yeah, how does it do that? I mean, yeah, so, I, I'm interested. Uh, so this sensor here, this is an older model. This sensor here is uh, the temperature, pressure, and humidity sensor. And then the winds are actually GPS based. Okay. And so it uh. will take the position it was, look at where it is now, okay. figure out that distance, how fast it moved between that, and that's how you get wins. But So this is just, this is not remote controlled, obviously. No. But you also have that. We are, So yes. we should talk about that, because you are also sending a drone into the, into the, into the storm as well. Yes, so. And, and we do have comments in our comment section about mm -hmm. drones specifically, so. Right. Yeah. So uh, we launched a, an uncrewed aerial system into Hurricane Ian. Uh, on that Wednesday flight, the one we were getting really bounced around. Uh, and this was the first time that we actually deployed that system into a major storm. Uh, it's a drone that has about a nine foot wingspan. It flew around for about two hours in the storm. And the really, this is still a, um, a prototype, a test of this new technology. But the goal for this is that the drone can get down to lower altitudes. It can go into more violent parts of the storm where we really can't safely go in the aircraft. And so, uh, this drone was down at 2,200 feet. It got down and recorded data all the way down at 200 feet above, above the water, so really getting that, that air-sea interchange. And so they're still looking at that data. They're, still, uh, they're very excited about it. Um, we're all very excited about it. It's a new and exciting technology, and we'll probably be launching more of them in the years to come. Great to hear. Mm -hmm. Next question comes in from, from Hendrick. We got a bunch in the queue. Everybody, you can still use hashtag hey Nick or hashtag hey Nikki to ask a question to one of our special guests from the Hurricane Hunters. And Hendrick wants to know, hashtag hey Nick, is there ever a situation uh, one cannot fly into the eye wall due to it being too dangerous, the conditions being too dangerous? I'll bring both of our special guests on, on screen here and uh, you guys can, can talk about it because Ian and Jeff, you've noted this on stream, bad, I mean, the eye wall was, was significantly devastating. Yes. I think I'll feel that one to, to Nikki specifically, as, sure. as she's the one really looking at the, the radars and really seeing what we're about to fly through up there. Mm -hmm. So that's exactly what we're doing. We're, we're looking at the radar. We have three different radars on board our aircraft. We have our nose radar up in the front. We have our belly radar, which is the big black M&M that you see um, below our aircraft. And then we actually have a tail Doppler radar that's mostly being used for research. So we have plenty of data to really look through and decipher before making that decision in terms of how we cut through the eye wall and penetrate into the center. So. Um, every single storm's different, right? And we're always looking for those changes that we might see in the radar data before we go inbound um, and keeping our wings really straight and level, which is what our pilots do best. And our, our flight engineer keeping that storm speed, you know, 210 knots, perfect as we go inbound and outbound from the center is, is what is allowing us to do this safely. So all this data is being interpreted. Um, has there been a time where maybe we've adjusted the track to go in through maybe a little bit of an easier portion of the eye wall? Sure, you mm. know, and those are decisions that are being made in flight real time. Um, we'll have a flight plan before we go in, but then once we are heading inbound, if we have to make an adjustment, we'll do so for the safety of the aircraft and our people. So if you see kind of an overshooting top, if you see a strong thunderstorm, a lot of upward rising motion, 
you, you will try to avoid going through that part of the storm? I would say, you know, things that we look at to kind of pick around would be things like mesocyclones, those little small tornadoes mm -hmm. that sometimes happen in, in the eye walls. Um, uh, vortex Rosby waves is the, you know, fancy term for it. Um, those are mainly happening in the lower level of the atmosphere. That said, we're flying up between eight to 12,000 feet, so we can still feel that updraft. Um, from that lower level rotation. So we try to go around those things sort of scalloping or sharp edges that we might see that would be, you know, potentially causing some sort of rotation in the lower levels. We might go around and, and make sure we're going through it at an easier point of entry. Um, but most of the time, you know, storm speed being right on point, which is what our flight engineers do best, our pilots keeping those wings straight and level, that's, that's the critical part of that. Interesting. Very interesting. Mm -hmm. And let's get to the next uh, question that comes in. And this this speaks to what you were talking about, Jeff, a short time ago. Not everyone is built to be a hurricane hunter, okay? Uh, Jen Magwill from, from my Facebook page says, hashtag AJB, how do they prepare their stomachs in training to not, I don't know why stomachs is in quotes, but it's okay if it's not in quotes. <laughs> how do you prepare your stomachs in training to not get sick while in, in, major, in major turbulence? Um, yeah, guys, is, is there, there a trick? A, is there a trick? You, it's... Uh, I think everyone prepares differently. Mm -hmm. uh, for me, I always make sure that I'm well rested, uh, well hydrated is the big thing. Mm -hmm. And then I typically just snack on a bunch of different things throughout the flight. Uh, I actually like to eat on these turbulent <laughs> flights. Okay. Uh, some of our pilots, they'll bring like a big beef burrito, prepare it in the microwave in the back of the aircraft. Are we talking eat. Taco Bell? Are we uh, talking Taco Bell on Hurricane Hunters? Maybe a little, a little higher than <laughs> well, yeah, yeah, yeah. But, Note uh, to self, do not sit next to Nick on Hurricane <laughs> Hunters. Okay, sorry, I got that. Uh, but typically, uh, you know, the, the more full the stomach is, the less of that like stomach acid you get sloshing mm. around. Mm. And so, at least for me, that, that's how I prepare. For me, uh, I really am not much of an eater on the aircraft, but I think it comes back down to just if you're staying busy, you're not really focused on sometimes what your body might be saying, hey, I'm hungry. But when you have all this data to go through and pick through before it's getting pushed off, really the timing, um, I think, kind of keeps you from thinking, oh, maybe I'm a little nauseous. So you don't have, you don't have then na nausea when you're, when you're up there. Is that, is that, would, that, would that be accurate? Mm -hmm. No, and I think your, your reference points too, right? I mm -hmm. mean, it's, most of the time it's dark or just very cloudy and gray, right? So you don't have this like, motion that you see as if you were on like, a boat that would maybe make uh -huh. you feel like, oh, I'm not so stable, right? right. Your reference point's focused on the computer, or whatever you're working on. And, th and th we, had, we have a question coming in about that specifically because we have this great video that you guys provided us with for this live stream, and Sandy wants to know from K-H-O-N. This is a question coming in, by the way, I know these call letters. This is from Honolulu, Hawaii. Mm -hmm. uh, saying hello Very all cool. the way in Honolulu. Hashtag, hey Jeff, great video showing three people manning the controls to go through the eyewall. Please explain why and what each person was doing. So if we, if we put this video up here, sure. can we maybe explain the different roles in, in the aircraft? I think that's what the commenter was asking. Yeah, of course. Um, so up front, there are two pilots, and then there is a flight engineer that sits in between them. Mm -hmm. The pilot in the left seat is the pilot in command. They're really just watching their instruments, keeping the wings level, making sure that we're staying on altitude. Uh, the flight engineer in the middle, they're really working the throttles. Mm -hmm. And so our- Would you be there or no? No, so okay. I'm, I'm, an, I'm just a run of the mill aerospace engineer, uh, okay. not a flight engineer. <laughs> okay. okay, I see. <laughs> so flight engineers working the throttles, they're focused on keeping us at 210 knots. That's our target speed. Uh, any slower, uh, you're gonna risk get a, getting to a stall at some point. Any faster, you're gonna risk overspeeding the aircraft. So 210, uh, years and years of experience, that's where we like to be. That's what the flight engineer is modulating those throttles and trying to hold to. And then the pilot in the right seat, they're just helping out, backing up the pilot in the left seat, mm -hmm. making sure that we're keeping that wing, those wings level. That's the most important part. But you forgot about Kermit. <laughs> what, 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 is, what is what is Kermit, Kermit doing? Kermit is up there for the ride, just having a <laughs> good Enjoying time. Enjoying the show. Exactly. <laughs> There's Kermit, everybody, uh, hanging in again. That's the name of the aircraft, correct? Mm -hmm. To make sure that I have that correct. Uh, Jeff, uh, you gonna apply to be a, a NOAA pilot? Is that in your future? I'm just gonna observe. I'm gonna be an observer <laughs> from the ground. Okay, I'm gonna observe. We've got Brandon from a, a, a colleague of ours, from one of our Next Star sister stations. Um, he says, hashtag hey Nikki, I'm a meteorologist from WFLA sister station, was on the air the morning that Ian rapidly intensified. What kind of eye wall structures were you seeing during the strengthening, uh, during the, the flight itself? I'd be curious to hear from, from all involved here on the stream. But Nikki, starting with you. Sure, and I, so I was actually on the ground this day, so I was not on this flight as, as you see Nick was. Um, so I'll let him to speak to what he saw on the MMR, which is our belly aircraft on our nose. But um, from what my colleagues, my meteorologist told me, you know, very, very sharp gradient where you see the change from red to yellow to green, very, very steep. 
um, which is typical of very strong eyewalls like that. But Nick, I mean, you saw it more than I did. Yeah. So uh, on our radars, um, as Nikki mentioned earlier, scalloping is something that is indif- indicative of mesocyclones. Mm-hmm. Uh, and that is something that we were seeing all along in a very patterned way along that northwest and western side of the eye wall. And that's the part that we were going through. What does and scalloping so, look like? Uh, it looks like just little fingers mm-hmm. coming out from the eye wall. And so into the eye, into the eye. Okay. And so we're, uh, we were watching the radars and I was watching the radar and, you know, I've done this for a few years at this point now, I'm not a meteorologist, but I was thinking, man, we've got to be coming out of this at some point. But what we were really seeing on our radars was a lot of attenuation. Mm -hmm. There was just so much rain, so much wind packed in that we couldn't really see what we were going through until we were already in it. Mm -hmm. You know, attenuation for the folks watching right now, essentially the radar beam can't really get through. in the way that it needs to, so that you can see everything behind it, right? You, maybe you can yeah. explain the No, absolutely. When you think of a radar, you think of a pulse of energy going out, it finds its target being a water droplet, and it comes back and says, hey, I found this over here. When you have a wall of water, such as what they flew through on this flight particularly, you have this this big, big, big wall that it may be only you know, scanning that first front of, and that is what the attenuation is. So just the power not being able to get all the way through because of how much water wow. is in this. That's that's impressive. Mm-hmm. I'm sure these radars are designed to not attenuate mm-hmm. to some degree. So when they attenuate, even though they're designed not to attenuate, mm-hmm. you know that you're dealing with a monster eye wall. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And we have two different, you know, that's the reason why we fly specifically our nose is a C-band radar. Our belly aircraft is an X-band radar. Both of those are being used operationally to make these decisions. You have kind of the, the benefits of one, and maybe a couple of limitations, vice versa. They're right. supposed to support each other. So when you have things like this happening, it's just something you got to work with in the, in the moment. Yeah. Right. Let's go to David Jones on YouTube Live. Hashtag hey Nick, this storm seemed to change its track pretty drastically from most models going more east. The main other storm that did this was Hurricane Floyd. Uh, is this uh, unusual? So so David and Jeff, you and I were talking about this on, on stream for, for more than a week as far as the a pretty, pretty drastic change in the track. But as you were noting on stream as well with our fellow meteorologists here with the Max Fender 8 weather team is that that still, you know, Fort Myers is still in the cone. They so were. it was yeah. a drastic, you know, shift a little bit more to our south, but it wasn't anything that was out of the cone of uncertainty. Mm-hmm. But to, to take this question here, as far as that shift, well, what do we make of that, you guys? It was in the envelope of possibilities. I mean, you know, we knew that, first of all, it was amazing, and you probably were amazed by this too. So we knew essentially 10 days out that mm-hmm. we were going to probably be dealing with a monster hurricane in the eastern mm-hmm. Gulf of Mexico. I mean, it's rare that we have that kind of clarity, but we had that clarity. Where we didn't know was the details, right? Exactly where would that hit? And that would make a huge difference on, on who was going to be impacted. And the whole time, the models, you know, at one point, they kind of they kind of windshield wiped their way back towards parts of the panhandle. And then at other times, they were through southwest Florida. And that windshield wiper, you know, really, that's the envelope of possibilities. The National Hurricane Center, obviously knowing that, and, and their forecast the cone was through, the edge of it was through Fort Myers pretty much the whole time. Mm-hmm. Uh, in fact, I think every cone, Mm-hmm. Uh, in fact, had part of the co- excuse me, yeah every forecast mm-hmm. had part of the cone through the area where it hit. So uh, we try to emphasize uncertainty, and I've heard people say, no, 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 try to make do you know make a call, Jeff. No, that's a very dangerous mm-hmm. thing to be like. Well, I think it's going to be on the western side of the Iowa or of the of the cone or on the eastern side. Well, when you make a call like that, you put people's lives in jeopardy. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And you know, one thing that I think is so important to realize too, is these are just one type of weather phenomena and a big globe of other weather features that are all impacting how that thing is moving, right? right? So you have things like cold fronts, you have areas of high pressure that are all kind of shaping and steering how these storms make landfall. And so the video we've been seeing now is from our WP 3D aircraft, the ones that are going straight through the storm. But we also have our other heavy, Gonzo, which is our high-flying jet up at 40,000 feet. And that's really what their main mission is to do, is to try to sample not only the storm, the envelope of the storm itself, but the features around it, right? Yeah, the environment things like around cold it. fronts, high, mm-hmm. high pressures that might help to shape and steer where this thing's going, specific to track. What you said is so interesting, and I, I, it's, I, it's a point that I always try to drive home. It is all connected. Mm-hmm. Everything on Earth is interconnected. And the truth be told, we often see this, typhoons in the Western Pacific can completely change the steering patterns across the, uh, across the United States. Mm-hmm. Something that far away, down the line, will have an impact on steering for a storm like this. So everything is truly, it's chaos theory, but mm-hmm. everything is truly interconnected on Earth. So one thing is just slightly off in our models in the middle of the Pacific Ocean, mm-hmm. and it is eventually going to have some impact on this storm. Mm-hmm. 
Let's get to, um, so here's what we're going to do here for as far as the stream. We have a couple of more scientific-based questions. Mm -hmm. Then I'm going to send things over to Jeff for any final questions that you might have, Jeff. And then we have a trio of kind of some fun questions in, in our comment section as well that we're going to end out with a little bit of some fun with, uh, with our commenters. Uh, but, but Jake wants to know uh, from the WFLA Facebook page, hashtag hey Nick, and you talked a little bit about this earlier, Nick, mm -hmm. but maybe you can, again, put this into perspective for our audience. Heard this was one of the worst storms to fly through. Any truth to that? And maybe you can both address this. Yeah, so uh, for me specifically, I've been in this job for six years, and I've flown most of the major hurricanes over the last six years. Harvey, Irma, Maria, Dorian, uh, Laura, and the flight through Ian on Wednesday morning last week was the absolute worst that I've experienced not just in the severity of the turbulence, but the duration of the turbulence. We were getting bounced around for what felt like an eternity. Uh, our flight director on board, uh, he had flown through Hurricane Patricia in the Eastern Pacific, Pacific mm -hmm. which is like the most powerful storm on record. And for years, that was his benchmark of, well, it was not Patricia, it was not Patricia. This storm specifically made him reconsider what he uh, has that benchmark at. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Yeah, Nikki, uh, your thoughts as well? Sure. Um, you know, so I was not on Ian specifically, but I have my, you know, list of top three as anyone who's flown on any sort of Hurricane Hunter flight has. Um, and I was talking to some of the scientists on the ground afterwards because we do fly with a lot of researchers as well. Been flying for 20, 25 years. And uh, their story was similar to Nick's. You know, they said Ian was in the top three. Um, so it was a it was a bumpy ride. Our Air Force uh, partners, too, said the same thing before they went in for that pass that day as well. Um, so it was just a it was a bumpy ride, this one. But what were the other top? ones for you. I'm sure. Curious. So I flew uh, Hurricane Sam last year. It was a category four storm. Um, it was mostly over the, the open waters. So no big impacts besides eventually to Bermuda. Um, but it was bumpy, similar G scale rating. Um, things you would think that would move around, you know, of course, get bumped around. Uh, we have uh, cots in the back of our of our aircraft where we're able to take breaks. Our pilots are able to take breaks if they need to because it's a very strenuous job as you would imagine, flying these aircraft. And those kind of come out of their place. The coffee pot might get a little uh, wonky, might have some coffee spilled over on the side. So things like that, expendables out of their usual boxes, as Nick knows back there. So these are the type of things you're looking for and you kind of measure when you think, man, that was a, a big bump. And you look back and you see some things out of place. You're like, yeah, that was a big bump. <laughs> and then the final question, then I'll s send things over to you, Jeff. Uh, Davo wants to know, hashtag hey, Nick, how dangerous is it really to fly into a hurricane? Uh, there's risk involved. Um, you're going through a violent storm. There's updrafts, there's downdrafts, but it comes back to, we have years and years of experience mm -hmm. on board. The pilots, the flight engineers, uh, the meteorologists, everyone is trained to do this job as safely as possible. Uh, and so although there is risk to it, we take every precaution that we can, other than you know just turning around and going home, mm -hmm. uh, to fly through these storms and to get back home safely. All right, well. Jeff, it's all on you to, to before we get to the final questions uh, on our stream. A anything else that you want to ask from a chief meteorologist standpoint? So, you know, um, over the past several years, we're, we've had a bad, uh, uh, some bad luck and a bad string of, of tough storms. A lot of Cat 4s and Cat 5s making landfall in the Gulf of Mexico. Uh, does it seem like we're kind of in just a very active phase for these stronger storms? Are we seeing more of this than, than we used to see? Um, or is it just essentially bad luck that over the past you know six years we've seen six cat four cat fives making landfall in the gulf of mexico and all of them strangely enough have rapidly or in, or intensified at least as they were making landfall so you know i'm gonna just start i'm gonna leave it to the climate experts there because i truly have not gone back through the 30 years worth of data to really watch and monitor those trends so people like the folks at the climate uh, prediction center with the national weather service they're going to know that answer much better than i will or nick will um that said you know we have had some really really active seasons we've been very busy uh 2020 last year even um this year started off a little bit slow but our team has been flying around the clock really for the past month month and a half now it seems like so it's just something that i think regardless of how active one season might be versus the next you want to stay prepared, right? We don't want to become complacent. We don't want to be like, oh, well, the last thing that might have hit was, you know, we think of Charlie, think of yeah. Andrew, all those, 
ones that impacted Florida. It's been a couple of years, right? And Tampa hasn't really had a true windstorm in a very, very yes. long time. We don't want to become complacent. So I think that's more of the focused message that we should all be really harping on. It is interesting because it would have been easy to become complacent this season because for about 60 days during the middle of the season, nothing at all happened. But yeah. it was almost an eerie feeling mm -hmm. that it was so quiet. And I know a lot of people remarked to me, they're like, well, it's too quiet. That kind of scares me a little mm -hmm. bit. Mm -hmm. What do you think? Uh, I'll, Nikki hit it right on the head. The folks at the Climate Prediction Center, they're really going to understand, you know, those 30-year trends and everything. Um, what we've really seen a lot of over the last few years and where we've really gotten unlucky is that rapid intensification, where we have seen a little warmer Gulf temperature waters. And what that translates to is there's just a lot more energy down there for these storms to come over and suck up and transfer into winds. Um, and so, yeah, I'll, I'll leave it to the climate folks to, to speak on it. You know, this storm was forecast to be a Cat 4. National Hurricane Center did a great job on that. Um, I think even though that is the case, I think there was some surprise, at least to some meteorologists, that it was able to. So it was essentially, you know, it was 120 miles an hour at 4 a.m. And by 6.30, when you guys went in, um, it was upgraded to 155 miles an hour. Mm -hmm. So that essentially is the 35 mile an hour jump in a matter of two and a half, three hours or so, which is almost on record pace for in terms of rapid intensification. Um, so the problem with something like that is, and, and don't get me wrong, you should be preparing for a 130 or 140 mile an hour storm, but a 155 mile an hour storm is significantly stronger in terms of the damage it can cause. I was looking at the NOAA website, I always quote this, but this is, I always find interesting, is you take a 75 mile an hour storm and a 150 mile an hour storm, how much worse is the damage potential in a 150 mile an hour storm? It's not two, it's not three, it's not four, it's not five times. It's 250 times more damage. So these, what might seem like small increases in wind speed mm -hmm. from, let's say, what was expected, 140 to 155 miles an hour, that makes a sizable difference. And when it happens right before landfall, mm -hmm. that causes even more major problems. Because people are like, well, 130 miles an hour, I'm not gonna evacuate, which of course they should. Mm -hmm. But at 155, I don't think there's too many people that are saying, I'm not gonna evacuate. Mm -hmm. yeah. So I'll kind of leave it there, JB. All right, we'll send it back. Thanks, over. guys, by the way, so much for, for joining. This has been so cool. Thank you for having us. Yeah. We'll, we'll send it back over to our commenters really quick for uh, three questions that came in that we think are really fun for you guys. Uh, as far as, um, you know, your experience and uh, how you became as well a hurricane hunter. JM on YouTube Live, hashtags for both of you as a child. Were you guys interested in in storms i know that we, we talk all the time jeff about how meteorologists so so commonly i think including yourself right mm -hmm. just wanted to be involved in three with mm -hmm. weather at, at a young age so is it the same as far as being a, a hurricane hunter oh yeah absolutely i think any meteorologist I, i've met fewer meteorologists that don't have a story or, or some sort of storm system that really tied them to um the passion of meteorology what was yours? Hurricane Charlie. Um, so I grew up in the Tampa Bay area. So I had plenty of hurricane days uh, all through elementary school. I used to track on my little hurricane tracker chart with my third grade teacher, Miss Mosca. We would watch him come close. And I wondered, why am I out of school? I'm a big, I'm a big nerd, always have been, love, love going to school. And I couldn't go to school and I wanted to know why. So I tracked that storm as I got closer. And then when we had these hurricane days, Hurricane Charlie specifically back um, when I was in middle school actually, was the one that sealed the deal. Like, okay, I need to study these a little bit more. Decided to continue my education there. Yeah. And how about you? Uh, for me, I, I grew up in the mountains of West Virginia. And so really the only hurricane tropical system that affected me when I was growing up was uh, Hurricane Isabel. Mm -hmm. And I remember we just got a lot of rain mm -hmm. in Southern West Virginia from that. Um, I didn't know that hurricane hunting was a job uh, <laughs> until I started six years ago. And now I'm six years into it and it's tough to imagine really doing anything else. Mm because it's just, the, the first hurricane flight I went on was Hurricane Matthew, and just to see the, the professionalism and the expertise of everyone on board that aircraft, the pilots all the way back, just really hooked me. And it really um, was inspiring to see like how important this work is and just how fantastic the people are that you get to mm -hmm. work with. Mm -hmm. As we look here at Kermit, our next question, of course, is, is about Kermit. Uh, and. Uh, Wanna, Chaz wants to know from the WF Facebook page, what damage was done to Kermit <laughs> during the flight through? And are we talking any concussion <laughs> protocols or anything with all that turbulence there, Nick? Uh, no, no concussion protocols um, and really no damage to the aircraft. Uh, like I talked about towards the beginning of the show, these are tough airplanes. And uh, we've got such a great maintenance team uh, who are working you know, well before and well after we go and fly these aircraft through hurricanes that are just making sure that everything on the aircraft is right where it needs to be. Everything's working properly before we ever get up in the air. Mm -hmm. 
I, see, I don't know. See, see, I, I took that as a as a fun question about Kermit, you know, hanging in the cockpit. Oh. I didn't know. <laughs> I didn't know if he meant the aircraft or right. if he meant Kermit, because we're getting so many questions <laughs> uh, about uh, Kermit course, as course. far as being there in the cockpit. Leave it, leave it to the internet to ask the, <laughs> ask the question about the hanging Kermit. The uh, the plush Kermit I, is undamaged. Undamaged. <laughs> yeah, okay, we can undamaged. report that exclusive here on Tracking the Tropics, Kermit. As far as the plush Kermit is doing okay. The final question <laughs> that I'll ask you guys, uh, this is this is a great one, and it comes from Julie from the WFLA Facebook page. Uh, hashtags all around. What would the hunters do if it wasn't their current job? If you were not a hurricane hunter, what would you guys want to be? That's a great. Do? That's a great question. Um, man, so I am very passionate about this job, so it's hard to think about not being in this position. I love what I do. Dream job for sure. But, you know, I think I'd do something a little bit less stressful. Just thinking mm. off the top of my head, maybe open a coffee shop, serve oh, coffee, okay, you know, yeah. a cup of a joe in the morning. Some, something that I can interact with the people and just have a little bit less stress, maybe. I've, uh, I've got three alternatives. Okay. Uh, a couple that I hope to accomplish at some point in my life. Uh, number one is part of the reason I got into this job, which is I want to be an astronaut at some point. Oh, and the advice I got from an astronaut was don't sit behind a desk. And so... Part of my job, at least, is not behind a desk. I'm on an airplane in a hurricane. And I feel like that counts. Uh, second thing, uh, if I wasn't doing this, I feel like I'd be a good high school history teacher. I just love history. That's my other passion. Uh, and then third thing, I want to open like a board game pub. Oh, and I think, you wanna, do you want to promote? Would, I, do you want to promote I, your I, event tonight? Because I thought you were going to say Jeopardy yeah. host. That's oh. what I thought you were going to say. He has an event coming up tonight. Uh, I, I host team trivia on the side. Uh, Hops 2.0, <laughs> downtown St. Pete. I ask great questions. It's a bunch of fun. Uh, but yeah, board game pub. That's what I really wow. want. Wow. So, so we need point, to, what we need so. to do is, is combine the two. Maybe there's a coffee shop and board game <laughs> hub hybrid. Uh, that would be great. Um, awesome having you guys on, on stream. Really appreciate it. Jeff, is there anything else you want to note as we look here again at just some of this very dramatic video of, from inside Hurricane Ian and from inside Kermit? Uh, you know, I just hope that we don't have anything like this anytime soon again. That's what I would say. And I'll just let me echo from our, our comment sections to both of you how much they respect you and appreciate the jobs that you do. Uh, bravo all the way around from uh, from Facebook Live to YouTube Live. Our comment sections are, are just lighting up with praise and appreciation for for what you do. So thank you guys so very much for, for coming in today. Did you have fun? We, we hope that you had fun oh, here yeah. on stream. Absolutely. You guys are great. Uh, we, re we really appreciate you having us. I uh, appreciate you guys taking the time to come by today. We know that it's been a, a lot and hopefully vacations in your future uh, after, of <laughs> course, all the work season that you did. Is done. November 30th. That's no, right. November <laughs> down to minutes. 30th. But that also brings us to what we'll end our stream on, Tracking the Tropics live every Wednesday, 2 o'clock, uh, 2 o'clock p.m. Eastern, 1 o'clock Central on whatever app, website, or social media platform that you're watching on right now. We also have additional episodes as storms develop. And, of course, we pay attention very, very much to the Hurricane Hunter flights because they give us that data that Jeff and the rest of our team here use to help forecast where storms are forming and where they're heading to next. So Tracking the Tropics is a program designed, of course, to keep you alert and aware as to the, tropicals, uh, the, the Atlantic tropical uh, hurricane season, excuse me, and, of course, we'll continue to bring you episodes on a weekly basis and as storms form. So for Jeff Berardelli, for Nikki Hathaway, Nick Underwood, I'm J.B. Buno. Thanks so much for joining us, and we'll see you next time on Tracking the Tropics. Thank you for watching Tracking the Tropics. Thank you for watching Tracking the Tropics.
Thank you for watching Tracking the Tropics.